Hello everybody, thank you for coming to check out this video. Um, in this video I'll be talking about a script that I wrote not too long ago for checking files in a large, large, large data set. And in order to do that at a, fair, at a relatively quick pace, I needed to use the Python multiprocessing library. I wasn't too familiar with the library when I started the script, so um, anybody else who has used this library before or is trying to use it now, you understand that uh, when you're starting out with it, it's not exactly that easy to wrap your head around. Some of the things that I learned was what sections of code are sent or are visible to the child process, how do you pass which uh, function you want the child process to execute, and then also how do you pass the arguments for that. Furthermore, I learned how do you get data from the child processes back to the parent process, and then also how do you stop the parent process from executing code until the child processes are complete. Now with all that said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Now here on the screen you can see the directory where all the files are that I'm going to be looking for. You can see they have a very distinct format to them and they have a very um, unique path to it as well. That's another characteristic of finding these files. That's something that I'll talk about later in the script. Now the script directory is here and I can run it from PyCharm like this. Now we'll take a quick look at the script in action and then after that we'll take a look at the multi-processing portions of the script and then last but not least we'll do a very high overview of what the script itself does you know from start to finish. So right now it's asking me which what string are you looking for. So I'll just put in something very generic which is timer. There's going to be a ton of fines on that. Um, Usually if I'm running this script, I'm going to be looking for something that's very unique, uh, very specific to the failure that I have in mind. Um, but again, I just wanted to make sure that we definitely get some hits on this. And you can see that um, each subprocess is printing out its uh, progress, how much, of, how much percentage is it complete, and then it also lets us know, hey, you know, I'm only 95% complete, I'm still working on it, and this is the file that I just completed. So um, if the script crashes or whatever, we have some indication of where we are, um, where we left off, when the crash occurred, uh, etc. Now, at the very end of it, after everything's at 100%, it, let us, it lets us know that the reading of the files is complete. Please wait while we write the results to a text file. Now, if we go back and take a look at our directory, we'll see that there's a text file here now. And it prints out all of the matches here for us. And then at the end it also tells us how long it took the script to run, which you can see it ran through that actually pretty quickly. Now getting back to PyCharm over here, um, at the end it lets us know where that file is. It gives us a, a, a name of the file which has the date and timestamp that way. Um, each file is unique. We know when it was ran. Um, and then at the end, it lets us know that, that it's the results. And it gives us the directory where we can find the file. So now that we have all that, let's go ahead and take a look at the parts of the script that are related to multiprocessing. So up here, when I'm importing all these different libraries, you can see that I import the multi that from multiprocessing I import process and I import manager. Now to import process, that's because I want to be able to run child processes. I want to do multiprocessing. I import manager because for the script that I wrote, I needed the child processes to communicate information back to the parent process. And in order to do that, you have to use this manager function. Now let's scroll down just a little bit to this line here, line number 95. Anything above this conditional statement, which is all the code here, these different functions that I have, and a class, anything above here is visible to the child processes. Anything below the line here, all of this is only code that can be executed by the 
parent process itself. That's that's actually something that had me a little bit hung up when I first started writing code with multiprocessing because I had sections of code that were executing so funky and in all these different orders and I didn't want things to be executing at the times that they were. I didn't want the child processes to be able to execute some of the code they were executing, so on and so forth. You can even see here in the comments that I talk about um, this, any of the code below this line, below this if statement uh, is code that would be ran by the, ch by the parent process, by the main process. And if you read it, it's pretty clear what it says. All right, now it says these are double underscores. A long time ago, somebody was giving a speech and they were saying double underscore this, double underscore that. Eventually, they kind of stumbled over their words and said dunder instead of double underscore. So now these are known as dunder. So if dunder name equals dunder main, then run the code within this conditional statement. Otherwise, don't run that code. And that's all the code up here that can be run by the child process. So child process can run it, child process can run it, child process can run it. Hey, if you're not the main process, if you're a child process, you know, keep yourself up here. Don't come down in this area. Now I stopped at a good spot here because if you look at the uh, comment here, you can see that this is where the four processes are being uh, initialized and they're stored as P1, 2, 3, and 4. And then we're telling the sub processes which function that they should call, and that's this one here, find lines uh, underscore function. And then we're passing some arguments to those functions, and that's going to be here within args, right? And if we go up to find lines function, which is here, we can see it takes one, two, three, and four different arguments when running that function. So let's go down here and see how many arguments did we pass? One, two, three, and four. Right, So we've met that requirement. But when we create these uh, child processes, that's all we're doing is storing them in a variable. It's not until we call the p1.start, p2.start, p3, p4.start. Um, that's when we're actually creating the child processes. And then what will happen if we do not put a, a check here, if we don't put a block, like a stop point, um, the parent process will keep on executing while the child processes are also executing. In my scenario, I needed the parent process to stop and wait for all of the child processes to be completely done before going on to execute any more code because the code that was later being executed in the parent process was dependent upon information from the child processes. Now I read many different ways to do this. I was looking all over Stack Overflow. I was looking on all sorts of different sites reading Python documentation. I tried so many different things. The only way I could get it to work was with a while loop and basically um, having the child processes feed information back to the parent process, letting me know, um, okay, how many files have you processed, right? So if I have 40 different files that I need to have processed, and I passed 10 files to process one, sub process one, sub process two, sub process three, and sub process four. So they each get 10 files each. How do I know that all four of them are done? So when P1 is done, sub process one is done, it's going to report back all of the files that it checked. So it should report back 10. Same thing for P2, P3, and P4. Now, once all of those have been updated, it's going to go into this for loop and eventually total files checked is going to equal the length of all of my files. It will be, this will equal to 40 and this will equal to 40. And we're only going to stay in this while loop so long as the two do not equal each other. So while this does not equal this, keep going through the loop, keep continuing through it. However, once this does equal this, then come down here and start executing this code. Now let's go back up to talking about the uh, manager. So first we have to initialize it. We have to initialize multiprocessing.manager and I'm going to 
uh, initialize it into a variable called manager. Now, these lists here that I'm creating are lists that I'm passing down to um, my child processes. But I, because I needed the child processes to update the parent process, I couldn't just create a normal list. I had to create a list using manager.list. So really it's, you know, this function has the ability to uh, call this. So we're doing manager.list. And then same thing with this dictionary down here. This dictionary is going to be very important, but it's data from the child processes that the parent process needs to know about. So uh, when I passed found lines to the child processes and I need them to come back and communicate to the parent, I needed to create the dictionary doing manager.dict. So now let's go ahead and walk through the script, right? We're coming in here. This is, um, all this all this up here is ignored at first when I call my script. All of this is, is ignored because it's not, um, it, it, it's not underneath this conditional statement. So the script goes to run and it says, yep, the name of this process, dunder, dot, dunder name is equal to dunder main. So let's go ahead and move forward. Uh, let's get a string. What does the user want to look for? And as you can see here, it asks us for it. So it's input. We provide that and that's going to be stored in provided string. And now that we have that, we're no longer waiting on the user. Let's go ahead and kick off everything moving forward. But before we do it, let's figure out the time that we started. This is going to allow the script to basically track how long it took to execute. That was something that was important to me because I was um, really trying to get this to execute faster and faster and faster. Next, let's figure out what directory the script is in. So it goes and does an os.getCurrent directory and stores it as pwd and then um, we create a list called file objects, right? We also create, it's an empty list. Then we also create um, a regex, right? So it's re.compile. We're going to compile this regex string and store it in this variable. So now we are going to call a function that we pass the present working directory to. So whatever folder we're working in, whatever directory we're working in, pass it to get SDL files. Now let's move back up to where that is. Get SDL files basically um, takes the, the past directory, which is our present working directory. It does an os.walk on it. And then for any file that's, um, that's found, basically check to see if right here, the file path, we're going to check it see if our regex string from earlier this one here regex file you can see is highlighted right um see if that regex string is found in the file path and if it is well then we just got a direct hit for the type of file that we're looking for so we'll say if there's a match then go ahead and do all this information get all this data and call the sdl files class passing this information to it. And then it's going to um, create a file object. And when it creates that file object, it's going to store it in that empty list that we had talked about earlier. This empty list here is going to be all of the um, references in memory for each file. So now we can move forward from this point. This is the last point that we talked about. Um, we talked about the manager already. So we get all these different things made up. Um, we divide all of, we figure out the length of the file objects right here, and we divide it by four. And we say that's going to be the first quarter. And then the first quarter times two, that will be the second quarter, third quarter. Now this is used for me to be able to use um, slicing in order to divide the, the uh, work up between the four different process. So basically, uh, we're telling subprocess one, you're only going to do from the first element all the way up to the value of whatever the first quarter is. So if we had 40 files, like in the example we gave earlier, it would go for um, from the value zero all the way up to the value 
um, 10 or whatever, right? And then same thing here, 11 to 20, whatever it might be. And then the very last bit is going to go to the end of the file. So now all the sub processes go. This is going to wait until um, all the files checked match the length of the total number of files. Then when all is said and done, it lets the user know, hey, we're working on writing this stuff to the file. So now let's take a look at the date and time. Um, and let's store it in a string format with it being year, month, day, and hour, minute, second. So now we're going to say the name of the file is date time, which is what we just got here, the string format, and this little trailing bit here. So now we say, open the new file with the ability to write to the file and create the file if it doesn't exist. That's why we have W plus. Now let's store that in the variable F. So if there were any found, if there were found lines, then write to the file. We're going to do a string function here. Write that the line found was started in the file below and do that for each line and file in this found lines dot items. Now remember found lines is a dictionary that was created using manager dot dict. And then what we say here is basically if the if, if, if we didn't find anything at all, then write to the file, no match found. And then we store that in to write and we say f dot write lines, whatever's in to write. And then let's figure out how long it took the script to run. And so runtime, the total runtime of the script is whatever we get back, whatever's returned from the function, how long. And now we go back into the file and we write in the runtime of the script. Lastly, we close the file out and then the rest of this script tells the uh, user in the terminal information about what was um, already written to the file. So again, this part, some of this could actually seem pretty um, confusing, but when we go back and take a look at the file, you can see how that uh, format is. Right? You can see that this, this line is printed. This whole line here is printed and then it says, this line was started in the file below and it gives the file. So let's go back and take a look at the script. Right line was started in the file below and then you know a little return statement essentially and then it gives the file and we're doing that we're doing a, a list comprehension here which if you're not too familiar with list comp comprehension i have a video on that i'll put it here in the top right corner of the video for people to reference but uh yeah if you have any comments or anything that you want to talk about in the in the uh, code here um Please comment down below on the video here. Let me know if you like it, hit the thumbs up. And uh, again, I'm putting this on the GitHub repository. So if this is something that you think you'd want to use, go ahead and uh, mess around with it a, a little bit and try to make it your own and uh, let me know how it goes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.